Good morning, all. I'd like to welcome everyone in attendance to the 13th virtual meeting of the Joint Select Committee on Human Rights, Equality, and Diversity. This is the committee's second public hearing into the implementation of the recommendations of the report by the independent investigative team, investigation team appointed by the cabinet of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to investigate reports of child abuse at children's homes. As this is a virtual meeting, I would just like to go through some small reminders. One, I would like to remind participants that this is a virtual meeting and certain specific guidelines would apply, including making sure that you mute your microphone when you are not speaking to help keep background noise to a minimum. Kindly ask that you adjust your cameras so that your face and your staff and all your surroundings is clearly visible. And to ensure that notifications from your cell phone and any other electronic device in your vicinity are muted during the course of this meeting. Members of the listening and viewing audience are invited to post or send their comments via the Parliament's various social media platforms, Facebook page, PowerView, the Parliament's YouTube channel, and also Twitter. I'd like to move on to the introductions. And I would like to introduce Honorable Ayanna Webster Roy, Member of Parliament and Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, Child and Gender and Child Affairs, and all members of her team and ministry. I would ask members of the committee as well. Can uh, Ms. MP, uh, Honorable Minister, can you introduce yourself and your team to the public? Good morning, Chairman, and good morning to the members of the committee. I am, as Chairman indicated, Ayala Webster Roy, Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with respect to Gender and Child Affairs, the National Affairs Coordinating Committee, and Central Administrative Services. Today, with me today, I have on my left Mr. Vijay Kalopasad, Acting Permanent Secretary, Gender and Child Affairs. I have on my right, Ms. Abini James, our project, senior project officer. And to my extreme right, I have with me Ms. Parkers, Ms. Gayatri Parkers, our senior legal advisor. Joining us online is our consultant, Ms. Jacinta Bailey Sobers. Thank you very much. I am Dr. Muhammad Yunus Ibrahim, chairman of this committee. I ask other members in sequential order to go ahead and introduce themselves. Um, Jillian John, member of the committee. Good, good morning, all. Anita Haynes, member of the committee. Good morning, all. Keith Scotland, member of the committee. Good morning, all. Shamfa Kajo, member of the committee. I would like to remind the public on the purpose and the objective of this inquiry, and it is to examine the progress to date by public agencies in the response, in responding to the recommendations made in the investigating team's report. I would like at this point in time to ask Honorable Member Ayana Webster Roy, Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, Gender and Child Affairs, to make a brief opening remarks on behalf of the ministry and it would be done thus far. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the major recommendations in the Justice Jones report was the establishment of an interagency task force under the Office of the Prime Minister to coordinate the national system and integrate operations across state agencies and ministries for the effective and timely delivery of care and protection of children in Trinidad and Tobago. In response to this recommendation, a standing committee on child protection was established. The committee is chaired by me and co-chaired by the Minister of Youth Development and National Service, the Honorable Foster Cummings. The standing committee on child protection was established to monitor, 
coordinate, oversee, direct, and supervise the child protection system with particular regard for the advancement of the implementation of the work plan recommendations prepared by the interagency task force. The standing committee is charged with the responsibility to make recommendations to cabinet for the improvement, strengthening of the child care and protection system, as well as report to cabinet on the functioning of the system. Since the establishment of the standing committee on child protection, there have been two meetings. The committee's inaugural meeting, which was held in January, and the second meeting on February 16, 2023. It is expected that the committee will meet again by March 23rd, 2023, before the frequency of the meeting shifts to bi monthly, a bi monthly schedule. Key matters which have been discussed and identified for priority action include the child protection framework, children's guardian policy, project management and implementation team, strengthening alternative care policies that focus on deinstitutionalization de and prevention, including kinship care policy, independent inspectors to inspect child support centers, proclamation of aspects of the children's community residences, foster care, foster homes and nurseries act, retreat with licensing of children's home, and the establishment of a facility for male and female children in need of supervision, who we call CHIDS. The accomplishments of the committee thus far include the development of a comprehensive child protection framework to guide the child protection reform process, review and revision of the children guardian policy, preparation of terms of reference for the following consultancies, review of the payment for child system, assessment of preventative programs in the public sector, assessment of, of the child care system, preparation of an initial proposal for institutional strengthening of the Child Affairs Division and Children's Homes Inspectorate, initiation of a project to provide financial assistance to unlicensed homes to enable their readiness for licensing. Five homes thus far have been approved for funding. Commissioner for Migrant Home for Girls, the home for male chins in Dio Martin will be operationalized in August 2023 and this is under the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. The initiation of audit of homes by the Ministry of Finance, which is ongoing. Development of a training proposal for caregivers and supervisors of children's homes in collaboration with the University of the West Indies Behavioral Sciences Department. Training is scheduled to commence in 2023. The interagency child abuse protocol was developed and scheduled to be finalized in March of this year, 2023. The Ministry of Health commissioned a facility in Cuba to accommodate children with mental illness on a shorter basis. The operational redesign of the Children's Authority was undertaken and the Child Protection Security Team proposal developed for the Children's Authority. Mr. Chairman, I wish to reiterate government's commitment to establishing a robust child care and protection system in Trinidad and Tobago I welcome the collaboration and support of all stakeholders, including the wider citizenry, as child care protection is everybody's business. Thank you. Many thanks, Honorable, for your very concise and uh, open, frank comments. Uh, it has, it, 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 even certain points you raised there, I, I believe. Uh, it, it will go very far from the findings of this committee. I would just like to, before proceeding and asking of questions, I would just like to remind all involved who would like to ask a question to make sure that your microphone is on. Uh, when you do ask a question and to remove it, take it off after. I would like to lead uh, Honorable Minister, I would like to just lead off on the questioning this morning and in the inquiry. And um, I do recall a few weeks ago that you did attend uh, a session in the Senate to answer some questions which was asked. And it pertains to my first question um, as it pertains to a proposed timeline for the proclamation of sections 3 1 and 2 and 17 of the Act. It has been earmarked for this month, March. 
I would like to find out what date in March would this this section, the section be proclaimed. Um, in so doing and in so answering, what is your assessment on the current state of readiness of the child protection systems on or by the end of March to fully implement with in conjunction with the proclaimed legislation? And I also would like to inside your answer, if it's not too bulky in my questioning, I recall that the submission listed a number of unlicensed children's homes. And how would the proclamation of sections 3, 1, and 2, and 7 of the Act affect the unlicensed homes and the children residing there? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that question for you. Um, in response to that question in the Senate, I would have indicated that barring unforeseen circumstances, it is expected that Section 17 of the Community Residences Act will be proclaimed by the end of March 2023. In terms of preparing unlicensed home for proclamation, the Gender and Child Affairs Division of the Office of the Prime Minister has been working closely with the Children's Authority to identify the homes that are in a state of readiness for proclamation and to bring them up to a level where they will be able to um, be licensed. Thus, I could pro provide for you the details in terms of the number of homes and where we are at in terms of their preparation for licensing. So, the Chickland Children's Home, according to the submission from the Children's Authority, is 91% ready and would be unmarked for proclamation of the legislation and to be licensed. And what we what, that we have outstanding there is the repair of the perimeter wall and that is being funded through the new line item which the Gender and Child Affairs Division would have received in the last in this fiscal year to um, assist with preparing homes for licensing. So that has that particular home would have received funding from Office of the Prime Minister already. The Joshua Home for Boys is 92% already, and they are marked to be licensed by the end of March 2023. The work that was outstanding is repairs to the bathroom, public health renewal. It has been approved, uh, it's, it has been approved for and funding will be ambitious. In terms of the Joshua Home, as I would have mentioned, 92% um, ready state of readiness for licensing. Um, the grant funding was approved. Not, the grant funding has not been approved as yet by the Office of the Prime So, however, we will have received documentation from the home and currently looking at that. St. Dominic's Children's Home is 92% ready and they are on target for licensing by the end of March. And St. Mary's Children's Home is 89% ready and should be on target for licensing at the end of March. Yes. In terms of those um, institutions that would have received, hmm. would have received approval from us in terms of funding, the request of funding, St. Mary's Children's Home, Marion House, Casa de Corazon will have received approval for their original submission. The Ferdinand's Place Children's Home will have received approval for the submission for as financial assistance, as well as the Jaira Rafa House. They will have received approval for OPM for funding assistance. Some of the homes identified by the Children's Authority that may not be able to meet, meet the deadline as of March 31st that we are looking at is the Jaira Rafa House, which is at that 82% state of readiness. What is outstanding here is the fire certificate and public health certificate renewal. And we are working alongside Children's Authority as well as um, the various agencies to see if we could um, get them to speed up the process to um, execute the approvals. Lady Hotoy Home is at 79% readiness and the Children's Authority indicated that they should be ready for licensing just at Jairo Rapper House by May 2023, 
What is outstanding is the public health certificate as well. Marian House is at 85% readiness and Children's Authority indicated that they should be ready by May 2023 and what is outstanding is the fire certificate. St. Mary Care Center South is at 88% readiness. Children's Authority indicated that May 2023 is a date by which they should be ready for licensing. What is outstanding is a public health certificate. And as I would have mentioned before, Mr. Chairman, the Office of the Prime Minister continues to collaborate with the Children's Authority and other stakeholders to see if we could expedite the process in terms of getting whatever outstanding certificates available to facilitate licensing. Um, Casa de Corazon is at 91% readiness for licensing. Again, what is outstanding is the public health certificate, the fire certificate, as well as approved audited accounts. So in Dean's place, Children's Home is at 76% readiness, and also May 2023 has been identified by Children's Authority as a date by which they could receive licensing, or standing against the public health certificate. The Transitional Home for Migrant Girls, which was recently opened and it was one of the um, action items that was recommended to improve the child care and protection system. OPM would have worked towards having that facility established. What we have outstanding there is the fire and public health certificate and our project officer is working with the necessary agencies to see if we could expedite that. So the Ross Nursery. So the Ross Nursery is at 79% readiness. Um, Children's Authority indicated that by September 2023 that they should be able to get license, their license. What is outstanding is the Fire and Public Health Certificate. And St. Jude's is currently at 70% readiness to licensing. Again, Fire and Public Health Certificate outstanding, as well as public certificate from employees. That's their medicals and food badges, etc. We are working alongside St. Jude's um, to facilitate that process. Um, Children's Authority indicated that there's one home that is um, that is a mark for closure and that is Operation Smile, and there's one non-operation unlicensed home. Please note this home does not have any children at present who are wards of the state and that is Margaret Kisto home. In terms of the number of children who may be affected, it's a total of 231. Mr. Chairman, what I would like to note is that the Office of the Prime Minister Gender and Child Affairs has been working with the Ch Children's Authority to really push the, uh, the alternative um, means of um, care and protection. So we recently received from the Children's Authority last Friday the draft policy for kinship care, which will allow for some children to transition once the policy is implemented, to transition into care by other family members who the authority would deem fit. We are also trying to ramp up and encourage the public to embrace foster care. Um, since I've been minister almost every year, we, there's a month set aside where we try to promote foster care, encouraging persons to welcome into their homes those children who are in need of care and protection, as well as adoption. But one of the key things, Mr. Chairman, for us is prevention. Getting the children before they end up before the court or preventing the abuse from happening within the homes so that children have to be removed. So we have developed a strong program of activities to really strengthen our families and to engage our homes to one, prevent abuse of children, and two, through the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, they have developed a suite of programs to help target behavioral issues so that those children who long ago would have been deemed being control who in court now put children in need of supervision, they would be able to have the engagement and interaction early up front so they do not end up before the court. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Cleo. Very concise answer. Um, however, we are still uh, would like to know what date the proclamation 
is foreseen to be? What day do you expect? Yes. So the problem, oh, so the problem is, as I mentioned before, we are, we, we are targeting the end of March. That has been our deadline date from the onset. I acknowledge that some homes may not be ready. However, with the financial support going to those homes that are already licensed and the ones that would be licensed by proclamation, we would be able to absorb some of the children in the homes that are currently not licensed. However, we will be still working alongside the homes that are indicated at 89% readiness, 79% readiness, etc. Because the Children's Authority will have in their submission to me indicated dates by which that they should be able to be licensed. So even the proclamation, as we said, barring all things, hope things go according to plan, the date is still set at March 31st. Thank you very much. Um, you did allude to the development of the kinship care in, in the, with the expectation, in the expectation, unlike you, um, However, if it is that the 89s and the 92s and the 98s don't make the 100%, um, what measures are in place for that transition to the kinship level of care um, versus the home care? So, Mr. Chairman, as I would have indicated, um, the Children's Authority would have submitted the draft kinship care policy to me as chairman of the Standing Committee on Child Protection last Friday. That um, policy document would be circulated to all members of the committee and to receive their comments before the next meeting. However, what the Children's Authority would have also indicated is that the capacity of the licensed home would be able to absorb some of the children who are, as you have mentioned, are currently in our unlicensed um, facility. So that would be approximately 60 children who will be able to be um, facilitated at those homes that are currently licensed. In terms of kinship care, it's the duty of the Children's Authority to work alongside, once the policies are approved and implemented, work alongside families of children to identify who they would, they would deem as fit persons to bring children into the home. What the kinship care policy does, it allows, and we will have received a, a funding for that as a new line item, it allows for us now to provide financial assistance to these families to be able to take children. And I want to give you an example. Um, as a member of parliament for Tobago East, People often reach out to me, and I remember a, 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 an aunt reaching out to me saying that I'm willing to care for my niece, however, I cannot afford it, and I don't want my niece to end up back in a home. And we would have worked with the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services in an, an sort of adult arrangement to get additional food card and different a food card for the, the home etc. to facilitate the child. Now with the kinship care policy and with the funding approved by cabinet and through parliament, persons who the children's authority, who are either blood relatives or maybe godparents or whatever, once they are deemed fit and they are able to accept the child into their home, they will have that additional financial support to ensure this care and well-being of the children placed with them. Thank you very much. Uh Honorable Minister, uh, when you were making your introduction, uh, I couldn't help but to register that a home for boys by the month of August, the Chins Boys, a classification that all of this committee has now very well learned, uh, is on its way for setup and functionality within the month of August. I um, couldn't help but to lament through all of the site visits um, that there was a somewhat of a backlog as it applies to the chins, the categorization of the chins, um, maybe boys or girls. Um, taking into consideration that this home is starting specifically for the male. Um, what immediate plans are, are there 
for girls and a home for girls, for children specifically. Can't hear you. Uh, um, yes, sir, you too, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that question. At present, and I'm sure you're aware, we have a mixed population of girls at St. Jude's where we have chains as well as girls in need of care protection. Um, the, the remit of chain girls is under the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. The Ministry of Youth Development and National Service did a presentation to the standing committee at our last meeting in February, where they would have indicated to us that they currently have in place a committee that has been established to, um, and I can read, read for you um, what, what cabinet would have approved for the committee, if you may allow me, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, honorable, uh, uh, honorable, just before we proceed, for the purpose of the viewing and listening public, I would like for them to understand um, that when we speak of chins, it is children in need of supervision. I mean, it's yes. a loose term we all have gotten accustomed to. But of course, we have we have children in need of protection and, and at home, and we have the chins, which is a higher level of, 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 of treatment and, and, and counseling that yes. is necessary. Yes, so ch chins to the viewing public is children in need of supervision based upon the extent of the need why they end up in homes. Go ahead, Mr. Minister, Madam Minister. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Cabinet will have agreed to the establishment of an advisory committee to develop a policy proposal for a restorative program and facility for female, female chicks, which you'll have explained will explain be those skills in need of supervision. And that will be to complement the current suite of youth development programs and facilities of the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. What the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service would have indicated to us at the last meeting is that they have already identified a facility that is in collaboration with the Ministry of Education that they're earmarking for the establishment of this Chin Girls facility, as well as they have been collaborating with various entities, for example, the Judiciary, Ministry of Social Development and Family Services, Ministry of Education, um, the Office of the Prime Minister, Children's Authority, to develop a restorative program, and that is in trade. And Mr. Chairman, given the commitment demonstrated by members of the committee thus far, I'm quite confident that the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service would be able to deliver this, this facility by the deadline that they would have indicated, which, was, which is in six months' time, in mm -hmm. matters August, from the date of the appointment, yes. Many thanks. Um, so there is the grand hope with everything, with, with, with the hope with everything being equal, that um, yes. time will come together and all will be understood and facilitated. And of course, with the constant push from your ministry, from the ministry, we should have the public health and the fire services and all the compliance officers small issues, big issues, but uh, big in task, um, smooth and over. So at the maximum, these homes can be, um, I think. I would now like to ask Member Haynes um, to... Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Um, Minister, thank you so much for your responses thus far. Um, I'm just going to... I'm going to follow on from a question asked by the chairman this morning. Uh, what we're looking at today, the genesis of our conversation, the, the, the space our committee is coming from is an examination of the recommendations from the from the Tudor Jones report and how far we have as a state, as entities involved in child protection, gotten in um, reaching these aims and objectives. So. I heard from your response, I mean, the chairman was looking very specifically, as all of us in this committee would have very great concern as to what happens after March 31st and some of and the sections are proclaimed. And, and, and I've heard in your responses that you said some of these children, I just want to quote, that some of the children um, 
being absorbed into current can be absorbed into currently licensed too. So my question, my first question today is what happens to those who don't fall into the sum after March 31st? Because if some of them can be absorbed in the in the um licensed children. So additionally from what we have seen in our site visits and, and read through other presentations, there is a space constraint, etc. And I appreciate what you said about the move to kinship care, et cetera, um, which I'll get to in my other question. But my first question is what happens to those who don't fall into the sum of children that can be, um, the sum children that will be absorbed into the licensed children's home? Thank you, Member Haynes, for that question. Um, I, initial, in the initial submission from the Children's Authority in terms of excess or additional capacity within the system at present, we could would be able to accommodate approximately 60 children. So that is 60 out of the 200 and approximately 230 children who are in unlicensed homes. The Children's Authority is also has also started looking at the reintegration of some children into, into, their, into their homes, right? As well as when the kinship care policy was this adopted, that would be able to absorb some additional children. However, I must note that we are working assiduously to ensure that those homes that are currently unlicensed, but at about 90, 90%, whatever, and would have been aired back by Children's Authority to be ready by the deadline we have set, which is the end of March, that they would be able to accommodate as many children as possible. Would we have um, a situation where some children would be in a facility that's unlicensed? I don't anticipate that because we are in constant discussions with the Children's Authority to ensure that we satisfy all requirements of the law once proclamation is done. But I want to I want to allow my peers to also come in here and share some information because he has met with the Children's Authority as Oh, yes, yesterday. I think it was. Yeah. Yes, good morning. I'm sure you'll share um, to answer the question. We, we have been, for quite some time now, we have been engaged with the authority and other key stakeholders in, um, in, in looking at the date March the 31st and the impact of March the 31st, especially on children. Um, we met with the Children's Authority and there was a commitment to continue to meet um, as early as next week, Monday again, to really firm up on this arrangement so that we prevent any child from not having a place to stay in a licensed home. Just to indicate that, um, and, uh, to add to what Minister is saying, um, 60 spaces have been identified and the authority will be working with these homes to, the, um, to be able to accommodate these children. By March the 31st as well, we anticipate that several homes would be licensed. So as a result of that, the numbers um, associated with those homes that would be licensed would be approximately 100 to 110 children. So it means that we will have possibly 60 children where we'll have to pay some focus attention to and discussion when we meet again on Monday. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, members of, uh, from the OPM delegation. Um, I appreciate your answer, but you know the difficult thing that you would be facing is while the you and and those associated with the OPM may be working very assiduously, a lot of these things are out of your hands um, in terms of what can be operationalized, what can be done by March thirty first, and in particular when we look at the the push on kinship care. One thing that resonated with our committee throughout the past um, few weeks is the, the constant um, recurring issue of the, the interagency responses so that persons are 
unable to mobilize the resources of social development. So I listened to your answer. And as a member of parliament myself, I mean, I can tell you how difficult it is to, to get that food card space sorted out, to get your grant space sorted out. And so while you may push for it from your space, and I, am, I mean, I appreciate that you may have a little more leverage in the OPM, but the fact remains that you are also depending on systems that have proven in the past to not be operating at the optimum efficiency to get what you need to get done in a time frame such as March 31st, 2023. And so you would appreciate we have a lot of concern about the 100 to 110 persons who we have no allocated space for at this time. Yes, um, thank you for that observation, Member Hintz. And I, and I understand, but I would now want to invite um, the consultant to speak about the committee because as well as the various subcommittees we have, and you understand why I believe, strongly believe that the, what we are doing now can work. So I'll invite um, Mrs. Bailey Sobers to join the conversation, please. Sure, thank you, Minister. And good morning again, everyone. Uh, the subcommittees of the Standing Committee on Child Protection are uh, aligned to the thematic areas of the Justice Jones report. So we have the subcommittee on legislation and enforcement of licensing and monitoring requirements. Um, that subcommittee <clears throat> is headed up by the Office of the Prime Minister, our uh, senior legal specialist, Ms. Pargas. And we also have um, the Attorney General representative there as the Deputy Chair. Um, we also have public financing for safeguarding care and protection of children and state collaboration and coordination, which is critical to the effective functioning of the child protection system. There we have family services leading, um, followed by a uh, uh, deputizing Ministry of Health. We also have the third subcommittee, which is operations of the Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, Children's Authority is heading up that subcommittee um, with the Ministry of Education deputizing. And the final subcommittee is one that would focus on abuse and absconding and operating systems for community residences and child support centers. And there we have national security heading of that subcommittee together with Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. So we would have discussed with these various subcommittees um, in the, our last meeting as they are beginning to meet this week, this coming week, um, on Monday, I believe the legislation subcommittee is expected to look at their priorities at the initial meeting. We would have um, discussed with each subcommittee um, what are the priority areas for attention for the legislation, the proclamation of um, the aspects of this act uh, is going to be on the table as a priority for them in terms of how we are going to address just what we are speaking about here. Um, ensuring that all children are care, all children are placed be, um, before the uh, act is the aspects of the act are proclaimed. Um, they also have other aspects of the work to look at, but this is priority together with the kinship policy and whether there's any legislation relevant uh, to operationalizing the kinship policy. And they'll be also addressing amendments. Um, to the various acts and the regulations, the revision of the regulations for the, um, the Children's Community Residence Foster Care and Mysteries Act. Yeah. So for each subcommittee, yes, sorry, Minister, you wanted to speak? Um, yes, um, Mr. Chairman, before um, PS um, Consultant Bailey Sobers, um, go, go ahead, I want to just um, mention to you the composition of the committee, the standing committee, because that is important and it will help to alleviate some of the fears of um, member hate, right? So the, the standing committee, the standing committee comprises of ministers and deputy permanent secretaries. These are the ministries representing the minister and the office of the prime minister, as I said, and the chair. The minister and deputy permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services the Ministry of National Security, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Planning and Development, the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, 
the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Legal Affairs, the Ministry of Labor. We have a representative from the judiciary. We have the chairman of the Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as the chief administrator of the Tobago House of Assembly and the administrator of the Division of Health, Wellness and Social Protection and the admi administrator of the Division of Education, Research and Technology. So we have key policymakers within the committee, so it sort of reduces the time frame for decision making. So that's one of the things I want to place on the table to help to bring some level of comfort to the public in terms of government taking this matter seriously. Please, Mrs. Bailey Subas, please go ahead. Thank you, Minister. So I was just highlighting some of the areas of priority I would have indicated with regard to the um, committee treating with the legislation, um, with the committee looking at um, uh, public, public um, <clears throat> financing. They will be focusing on the various assessments that we have to do. They will be also looking at um, the hybrid education system for the children in the in the various homes and also the transportation for the children. Of course, operations of the CAT will be dealing with all the policies that have to be reviewed in CAT, looking at the restructuring that was recently done in the Children's Authority and also looking at the resource issues, human resource and otherwise, and in particular security issues with respect to the children's homes. And there is that's where they sort of um, <clears throat> merge with the other committee, which is dealing with absconding, uh, so that they will both treat with the critical issues for complaints, getting complaints from the children in the homes, and also the security issues to prevent child abuse. So these were the various issues that were highlighted at the last meeting for urgent attention when the committees commence their meetings um, this coming week. Uh, thank you. Member Haynes, are you um, comfortable with the responses given? Um, uh, I have some more questions, but I note that uh, Member John had her hand up, so rather than... She does, she, 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 <laughs> she does have a hand up for a while now. Yes, so uh, I will um, stand down for now, and as, as we continue, I'll raise other questions as they come up. So I, I, I now uh, ask Member John to ask the question. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Um, Honourable Minister, in the Office of the Prime Minister, I mean, I was really happy to hear uh, that the that you all are paying attention and there are lots of, a few committees and key policymakers, as you explained. But I'm still concerned that coming to this end of the month, that was a very vital um, question the, the chairman asked. And I think in keeping with those of us who would have visited, that there'll be 231 children affected at the end of this, because we are talking about the end of this month, which is a very tight timeline. Um, what is suggested is that the children are entered into kingship care or foster care. But I also um, would have had sight of a, of a strategic plan uh, dated May 20, 18, 2015 to 2017, which took over two years, where we have about 10,211 cases. I know it's a bit dated, and maybe things would have improved over time. But if it is, this report has been saying that 599 cases, for instance, is a peak, um, referencing that in March 2016, and in the lower um, period will be 256 cases, per month entering this system. If it is spaces now are being taken away based on the fact that one has to comply with the proclamation of the law, what is going to happen now because the redundancy is over in addition to which, when we went to the various homes who are not maybe the 92% and so have you, what have you, they were not at full capacity. Is it that one, when you look at the spacing, you're adding up those also in terms of potential, but that's only 16. You know, so you have the addition, the 170 who are not accounted for, and then those will be coming in every month because another, um, just allow me, please. I am. I was happy also to hear you say that you all are starting at the level of prevention. I, I don't know how are you going to do that because I think what has come to, to the surface is that we have some very cruel parents in Trinidad and Tobago. And, and, and really that has to be identified and we I agree that you have to work at the root of it. But how are you doing that? Where, is there a good aggressive um, approach to, to that, that prevention? 
Thank you for that question, Member John. I will start to answer and then I will um, invite my former secretary to join the conversation. Um, two things to note. Not every call or report would result in the need for a child to be placed in a facility. That's one. Two, almost on, it's fluid. Almost on a daily basis, children may exit the system. So we may not have the same number every month. And also, as I would have indicated before, apart from looking at the kinship care and what the excess capacity in the current licensed homes, we are working to ensure that those homes that are state of readiness would be able to accommodate additional children. Because um, some of the homes now that are unlicensed, once they are licensed, they will be able to accept more children. So we've seen where we would be able to um, satisfy the majority of the existing need, but you raise a very crucial point, and that is the preventative measures to ensure that we do not have children needing to be placed. And the Office of the Prime Minister, General and Child Affairs, will have been working alongside various agencies and entities, as well as civil society organizations, to really impact our communities and our families. So in terms of children and helping children to become advocates for their own rights and to be able to, 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 to demand better, we have what we call the Child Ambassadors Program, where we train children about their rights under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, as well as the responsibilities that accompany those rights. And then we have those children becoming advocates in communities for us. We would have developed a child, abo a child abuse pick course program, which would have reached over 9,000 persons, I believe it was. I think we would have received the People's Choice Award from the IDB's program for that child abuse pick course. Uh, educating the public and sensitizing the public about child abuse and the ills associated with child abuse and the impact it has on our society. We have been working in terms of those vulnerable women engaging civil society again to reach out to women, providing information and guidance. We partner with TT Post to distribute over 400,000, almost every household in Trinidad and Tobago would have received information on child abuse as well as domestic violence, advising on what I remember in another committee we have a member where the chairman would have been, but we had TT Post before indicated that he wanted to commend the government and TT Post for the collaboration because in a rural community, he got wind of that a particular family was able to say it was because of this information that came in the mailbox. They knew what measures to take, what to do, you know, to address a particular situation in their home. So we are working, and there's always work to be done. And I want to stress to the viewing audience how important it is for us as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago to respect rights, the rights of our women, the rights of our girls, the rights of our children. And this is an ongoing conversation that we must always have. I want to also invite PS. I keep saying PSB, which was just a former permanent secretary, our consultant, Bailey Sobers, to talk about some of the collaboration we have had with the UN system, as well as um, some of the work we have been able to accomplish under the Spotlight Initiative to end family violence in Trinidad and Tobago. So, consultant Bailey Sobers, you may join the conversation. Thank you again, Minister. Um... I want to begin with the collaboration. We have been collaborating with our UN um, partners, particularly UNICEF. Uh, we have partnered with them with respect to uh, our terms of reference for the payment per child um, system. We are reviewing that system. And so we would have shared with them the terms of reference um, recently also. Uh, we would have partnered with them with respect to a mission um, of a child protection specialist from Romania. She um, was able to come and share with us and also the Children's Authority with respect to how they were able to strengthen the child protection system in Romania. In particular, they focused on deinstitutionalization and prevention, and they were able to reduce 100% of their um, children in care 
to um, close to 20 to 25% from 100%. Um, of course, they use foster care. They trained up foster carers for special types of children, like children with disabilities. And they also use kinship care as a way of um, ensuring that children do not come into care um, and legislation so that children who are below two years of age will not be placed in care. And then they phased it so that after two years, children below five years will not be placed in care and so on. So using that model, they also um, used a mapping model where they were able to test their, um, <clears throat> their program in one particular area and then roll it out in other areas of Romania. So they shared their good practices with us. And at the end of the um, mission, um, Ms. Voika Thomas, she was able to leave with us a draft for the, pub the policy reform of the child protection system um, with us. We have a roadmap for the reform and we are looking at it with um, Children's Authority and other key stakeholders to implement over the next two or three years. Um, she was also able to help us with the protocols. We had a session on the child abuse protocols, which is being finalized by Children's Authority. We were able to give our input together with the other key stakeholders so we could finalize that very important um, protocol. We have also been speaking with the can Canadian officials in terms of their child protection reform and ways in which we can collaborate with them and learn from them also. So we've done quite a bit of collaboration as we move forward with our own child protection reform and the implementation of the recommendations of the, the report. Thanks, Minister. Yeah. Hey, uh, Mr. Chairman, my um Peter, yes, would also like to intervene, please. Sure. Chair, thank you very much. For, um, and I think it was very um, important for the consultant to, to take us along that line because the, the member asked, you know, what we, are we doing to ensure that um, what, what we are proposing actually takes place? And I think that what we are trying to do is to make sure that we learn as much as possible as it relates to how different initiatives, especially those that deal with prevention and uh, reformation, how they are marketed, how they are, how they are implemented in, in some of these countries to allow us to learn lessons that we can either adopt or adapt in the Trinidad and Tobago situation. We as well, um, a delegation is um, headed for the CSW 67, the Commission on the Status of Women 67. And we have all already reached out to some of the ministers who are going to be there, and there will be a, a number of ministers there indicating to them that we would like to meet so that we could, we could share experiences on what they are doing. Rwanda, being one of those countries who have made some significant strides as well um, in the area of child reform and child protection, I think um, in our last discussion with, um, with a consultant, Rwanda would have indicated that the last two orphanages that's what we call the orphanages that they have in the country is expected to be closed soon. So I think with the with the, the information that we are getting from all of these entities as to as to how to we'll be able to learn some lessons that we'll be able to to use here in Trinidad and Tobago as well. I, wonder, I just want to have um I have one more question and just a little comment. Um, thank you, Mr. No. Minister. Sorry, Chairman. May I proceed? No, no, proceed. I would like to write after the answer to your question. I would like to invite Member Scotland to make his contribution and question. Certainly. Yeah. Um. I'm very happy to 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 hear, particularly the Rohan experience, because I mean, we we have some real issues. It appears in in terms of our own local situation. And notwithstanding all that is happening, I want us to be mindful that the operational space is actually in the children's home. And what we kept hearing over and over, the children don't want to be there. And um, the supervision was also indicating that it is better if they are not there. So if we are moving aggressively into ensuring that our children are not going into that space, I think that will be a lot better. And my the question I want to ask now, um, Honourable Minister, is um, I know there's a legal age of 18 years when they must leave the facility, the state facility. And uh, there are some homes who have uh, uh, well-defined um, 
transitionary um, period if it, from 16 to probably 18. Now, that is one thing in terms of harmonizing that. What happens between 16 to 18 to ready or the, or the children to leave state here? But what happens after? You know, um, how is it mapped? How are they managed? Uh, it, it's, I think it's something that one has to keep the eyes on, not because the state is not legally obligated to continue, but there is a big fallout after they leave state care that I think will have a negative impact on society if we don't um, really intervene. Thank you for your observation and your question, Member John. Um, and I, I, it has always been my philosophy, it has always been the philosophy of this government that our children should grow up in loving, stable homes. We don't like the idea of institutionalization. This government, this team, we have always stressed the importance for how, how important it is for us to strengthen the institution called the family, so that our children, and that is one of the basic rights of every child according to UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So having said that, I want to now go to the issue of transitioning. And as you have mentioned, you would have seen um, transitioning programs in some of the homes, um, St. Dominic's, St. Jude's, despite all the things that are not in public, the public domain, St. Jude's is actually doing some good work and they also have a transitioning program, St. Mary's. The other homes are also trying to have built in a transitioning program, but it is important to note that the transitionary services are under the remit of the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, and they have been developing a suite of programs to target um, those children who will be transitioning out of homes in terms of accommodation and in terms of services provided for them. Just recently, we have seen the commissioning of the Josephine Shaw facility. We have seen the subterranean for another facility in Sevilla, yes. as well as there is the male transition in program in South Trinidad, Central Trinidad, getting up the geography, mixed up Central Trinidad. Um, Member John, another important factor to note is the coming on stream of the National Children's Registry, because this allows us to track and monitor children. And for those who would have been in our institutions, we would be tracking them up to the age of 21. So it's not a matter of 18 and you leave and we drop you off and we forget about you. Through the registry, we'll be continuing to monitor the various agencies that our children will be coming to contact with to ensure that up to the age, especially those who have been in the state care up to the age of 21, they get that continued support and monitoring. And I want to go back and make a call to the public. Child abuse, child care, child protection is everybody's business. It's not about IANA and OPM. We all have to play a part in ensuring that our children have the best possible version of Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to stress that to the public. Sometimes people sit in the corners and they're thinking, what happened in the neighbor house that is a neighbor business? But you don't know if your neighbor son might come and marry your daughter, or your daughter might go and pick up somebody in the neighbor house. So we all have to play a part in ensuring that we raise young men and women who would go on to become adults who make a meaningful contribution to society. Thank you for the opportunity. Member Scotland. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, through you, um, the investigative team recommended, and, and I quote, that the state in its expenditure and assignment of resources must prioritize investment in child care system. And that is so, to gain sustainable early prevention of delinquency and prioritize this in the national development agenda. How would the Honorable Minister describe the level of priority given to child protection in Trinidad and Tobago? Thank you, Member Scotland, for that question. I know some people don't like when I say it because it's, it is often repeated in the parliament, right? That but uh, okay i i have seen great commitment by this government and by the minister of finance to facilitate the needs of the child care protection system people often complain that minister of finance hand tight but when it comes to providing resources for gender and child affairs and children's authority even when things tight 
is always found a way to ensure that we get a good enough slice of the pie. Right, so let me put that on the table. Recently, the Children's Authority was before another committee, and the Children's Authority would have indicated that with the additional $50 million pledged by the Minister of Finance, and I'm saying this publicly, and I'm thanking him again, he pledged $50 million additional at the media review. The Children's Authority noted that that $50 million additional will bring them up to 97% of their funding needs for fiscal 2023. And the Children's Authority also noted that they received 4% of their funding requirements from donations. So that is the Children's Authority. Gender and Child Affairs also received funding for a number of different programs. Now, if I look at Gender and Child Affairs and Children's Authority over the last five years, $910,638,064, almost a billion dollars would have been appropriate in expending agenda and child affairs and children's authority over the last five years, almost a billion dollars. And that is just this ministry. There is a ministry of social development and family services receiving funding. There is a ministry of sport and community development where they have the community mediation program that goes into communities and work alongside um, families and individuals and groups to help to resolve conflict receiving funding. There's the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service receiving funding. There's the Ministry of Education where student support services is um, available receiving funding. So there has been significant investment. I mean, we, we know ourselves as human beings, any amount of money is never enough. We always want more. But given the economic circumstances, given the challenges over the last seven years, I would say that there has been a meaningful, concerted effort by the state to resource the child care protection system. Yes, we still have more work to do, but as I would have mentioned at the start in my opening, there is an unwavering commitment to ensure that we establish a robust child care protection system in Trinidad and Tobago. Additionally, we are seeing where corporate Trinidad and Tobago is coming on board and joining us in small for efforts. So, as I mentioned before, it is an all of society approach, not just an all of government approach. And I want to also identify the fact that where sometimes the state may not have been able to meet the financial commitments for certain programs and projects, we have been very blessed to receive funding from international agencies and various um, embassies and missions in Trinidad and Tobago. After the Justice Judith Bruchot's report was made and we, we saw the issues in terms of additional resources needed for homes, we saw the People's Republic of China through the embassy here providing financial support to us. UNICEF is sponsoring or consultant as well as the BOA the, and the administrative per person who is supporting the standing committee. Is it, that is not the state. That is an international agency. UNICEF would have supported us tremendously in establishing the Children's Registry. Through the Spotlight Initiative, which encompasses not only the UN system, but the EU and other countries, we are seeing where funding is coming in to strengthen the, the, the family institution in Trinidad and Tobago by addressing gender-based violence and family violence. So we're seeing where the commitment is coming from the state, from our development partners, as well as corporate Trinidad and Tobago. So I just want to, at this point, to say thank you for those corporate entities that have been assisting us. And my case would also like to step in and contribute to the discussion as well. Um, before, uh, before the PS uh, makes a comment, um, and, and, and so, I, I think the government, the member Scott Mann would have had, would have liked to add something. Um, there's just one observation I would have liked to share. Um, as it pertains to, I mean, I'm really happy to hear about this level of commitment and funding and, and, and making ends meet on the priority level. Um, the report, however, since it was launched and discussed in the open uh, and, and ventilated within our Houses of Parliament, um, what we've heard from at least two out of the six homes that we visited was that since that report came out, the general public of Trinidad and Tobago, who would have contributed regularly, corporate and private and personal, um, also in conjunction with the COVID pandemic, it has dried up. And um, it was a point of concern, actually, um, two particular homes. 
Um, and I'm glad to hear that the subventions and the external funding is coming in still because uh, we know what the priority level is. This is a comment, um, Member Scotland. Yes, Chairman. Um, Minister, Chairman, Chairman, I'm, Minister I'm, not, I'm not hearing you, Minister. I would like to move on to my next question. Thank Please you, proceed. Chairman, through you. Since the publication of, of the investigation team's report, um, how has the sustainable early prevention of delinquency, how has that, min Honorable Minister, and your team tell the country, tell us in real terms, how has that been incorporated into the national agenda through the policies and program of the Office of the Prime Minister and the, and the Child Protection Unit? Okay, could you could you expand on that for me, please? Um, Member Scotland, um, my peers will answer that question, but before peers answers, I just want to put something on the record. Prior to this government in, instituting the payment per child system, homes, apart from the, the saints that were receiving a subvention from the government, did not receive any financial support from the state. They survived based on the goodwill of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It is under this government where a payment per child system was developed, which we said if we are placing children who are basically wards of the state in the homes, we have a duty to support them, and we have been doing that. And we are reviewing the level of payment per child as well. So I will now ask PS to respond to your question, um, Member Scotland. Thank Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, we have developed um, a terms of reference to look at the, um, all of those preventative programs that deals with youth, uh, youth who are at risk. Um, we are hoping that, um, the, that with, with that discussion and through the committee and the subcommittees of the, um, that was appointed, we will be um, doing some further work examining the terms of reference and trying to map these programs to determine how effective these programs are operating um, as we move forward. Ch Chairman, if I may. Chair, can I ask, my, my, Madam, you know I always give way, but Chair, may I just ask my, my second question before my most esteemed <laughs> Member of Parliament colleague comes in, please? Sure, Do Member. you, Chair? Yes, Thank you. It, well, was it completes the line of questioning that you're coming with? Yeah. Yes, I'm, I want to complete it with this last question. How is the Office of the Prime Minister liaising with the protective services to ensure that real protection in terms of manpower is given to our most vulnerable children who may, who may be at risk in these homes. Could you elucidate for the country on that, please, Honorable Minister? Want to know how we are liaising with protective services to ensure that the Yes, how, is, is, there, is there a collaborative effort so that you have the homes in case there's an issue that you have links with the police to investigate um, punitive? That is, That's what I mean, Honorable Minister. Yes, yes, that, that, is, a given, that is a given member, Scotland. Um, to the Child Protection Unit, we have a very close working relationship. Um, if I may share a, an example of something that would have happened at a particular home, there was a so-called riot at a home and um, we went to try to quell <laughs> the uprising at the time and when it wasn't working out, we were able to reach out to the police, the police um, station within the, the vicinity and we had immediate response. And there's always been a very from my experience, a very close working relationship with not only the Minister of National Security in terms of reaching out and getting agencies to respond, but I remember in the past when we had challenges at uh, various homes, we might have had fights, etc. I had the ability to contact the commissioner and say, hello, we have this situation, please send somebody in to, to assist us. So we have that. 
um, in terms of um, investigations, whenever we we have reports of any um, untoward incidents at any of our homes, we immediately, through Children's Authority, would refer it to the police service for investigation, and we allow the police service and the judicial system to do what is necessary to ensure that our children get the justice that they deserve. Um, Chairman, I would give way to uh, my learned colleague once I have your leave to come back with my second round of questioning, Chairman. Yes, please proceed, our member Higgins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Member Scotland. Uh, Minister, uh, I, I, I want to the PS spoke shortly to discuss, um, because the PS discussed the terms of reference to look at the effectiveness of programs. But my, my question across the board now, um, we've been discussing a lot of things. And at your last intervention, respond before, before on the collaboration with the um with the protective services, we were discussing the we were discussing the financial um the allocations and what has been what has been occurring with your your allocations, the budgetary allocations, etc. Um, and so you inform the public, members of the public, that um over the past two years, the various ministries would have gotten a good enough slice of the pie that, that the direct would. But my question then is, what we are discussing impacts the real lives of, of, of some of the most vulnerable citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And I personally believe that we must, as a society, move to data driving our policies and the data needs to be not just collected at the beginning but it also needs to be monitored monitored and properly evaluated as to its effectiveness so if we are being told today that over the past seven years we have received within the child protection spaces within the spaces that look at what is happening to our most vulnerable children, that we've received the allocations necessary to get the job done. We've received the releases necessary to get the job done. And so in, a ter in terms of investment, we have all that we may need. We may not have what we requested, but it is sufficient to get the job done. Then my question is, why hasn't the job been done? Therefore, because we have to be really careful in assessing effectiveness of our policies. So if it is not a resource problem, then we have to highlight where the problem is arising. Is it an implementation problem? I mean, we've listened to a lot of programs. I was supposed to come back to my um my my question on the standing committee and 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 where you are at to in terms of, yes, there's a lot of discussion, but is it that we are reaching an implementation roadblock? And so if resources aren't the problem, then the reason we're having a discussion today, the reason we're not getting the results, the reason that we are seeing an overall, um, uh, this, that the system is not performing as it ought to be, then we have to really be direct with the public, with everybody paying attention here today as to where is the problem? Where are we hitting the roadblock then and not seeing the results that we hope for? Um, so I'll start there and then Chairman, just I have one more question to follow up after that. Um, my, thank you, Member Hines. I would start and then I'll ask and get my peers to come in. And yes, part of the problem is implementation. I'm not going to um, pretend as to that, 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 that isn't a challenge. So for example, um, you, you may make resources available to a particular agency or entity, and you would, you would reach out, follow up, but at the end of the day, you have to have ensure that persons do what they're supposed to do. That's one. Two, you said that we've invested a lot, but we've not really seen a real change in terms of numbers. It speaks to a wider societal issue. And for us to ensure that we have a reduction in number of cases of abuse and children who, because of whatever issues, end up before the court, it speaks to us addressing a, a need for behavioral change. And 
engaging society in a particular way so that we could change mindsets and foster a change in behavior that where, as I would have mentioned before, we allow, we encourage citizens to value rights, to look at children, not just objects, but real persons who have rights that we must respect. And that is something that would take some time. I remember um, there was a discussion around um, child abuse at one point in time, and somebody said, you want to tell me how to discipline my child? But it's not about telling how to discipline your child, but it's telling you the best way to ensure that your child, by you not disciplining your child in a way that could cause harm, would then become somebody who then go and hurt somebody else, because they're saying hurt people, hurt people. But my peers would also like to speak to some of the institutional issues and put things to um, delivery. Thank you, Minister. And Chair, through you, um, I add to what Minister was saying, but um, I, I want to paint a slightly different picture here in the sense that Minister would have indicated earlier on that there is an enormous amount of investment from several key stakeholders, OPM, social development, youth, and several others across the social sector. But I think one of the reasons for the um, you know, the not so effective um, social protection system is that this this system is not is not working in unison. It is not an integrated system for child protection. So everybody is doing what they are doing, and they are doing it in their own space, and they are doing it with their own personnel, and they are having some desired effect. But I think the the overall picture is a child, and we have to treat with this child in totality and not not at social development we give them a food card so that they can feed themselves and then as you they give them something else we, we need to develop an integrated child protection system to be able to see the benefits of the investments that we are making and that is what we're doing through the standing committee Ah, well, well, thank you. Well, then that gets me exactly where I wanted to be because I under, I completely agree that there needs to be an integrated system. And so having identified the problem, that it is a problem of silos and it is a problem in, in large part of us really it, it persons operating and, and trying to achieve the same goal but may not be taking the same road to achieving that same goal, right? And therefore, we end up duplicating efforts, wasting resources, etc. So then, from having having identified that problem, and Chairman, you'll see this clip goes right back to the standing committee. Then tell me, where are we then? With I well, having identified what the problem is, tell us as a nation now, where are we with the solution to that problem? So one of the one of the first. If, if, if I may, if, if I interject on the question, um, and just add a bit on to Miss Hin's question, um, I would like to go back to what um, the acting permanent secretary has said, and it is something that spurred on many a discussion whilst we were at home. It's not just between himself and I, but on the whole, um, this integrated all hands approach um, definitely um, needs to be done in a manner where it would allow real time results without the levels of bureaucracy. And, and I just wanted to interject that at this moment here. Yeah. Proceed on, Ms. Smith, Madam Minister. Okay, so um, I'm going to start to answer member Hayes and then I'm going to invite the consultant to, to come in as well as peers. So that is where the reform um, takes place. One of the first pieces of document that we would have shared with members of the committee is a child protection framework where we, so, we, we identify where each key ministerial agency should, how they would intersect and how they should operate. And we send that out for review and for comment by the members of the committee. We would have received the support and approval of the committee members, they would have reviewed, submitted their comments, and we would have redrafted the document. But there has been consensus on a new method, a new approach towards child care protection, and a new framework for the system to operate. I want to invite um, consultant Bailey Sobers to speak to that particular piece of document as she was um, instrumental in drafting it. Thank you, Minister. 
so every child protection system in every jurisdiction should really have a mapping of exactly who, which are the agencies in the system. So we would have done the mapping, we would have identified which are the agencies and ministries in the system, what are their roles, what are their responsibilities, the governance arrangements, who's overseeing the system. We have the very important standing committee, you heard about them, and we are also looking at other elements to include. So when we get the consensus on, on that um, system and that framework, we can know everybody's on the same page, and we could now move forward in terms of implementing the child abuse protocol, because that's the next step. The next step is the actual tool that is gonna allow everybody to work together and to get the system working as it should. So as I indicated that protocol, which would identify, okay, when a child, wherever a child comes into the system, who is, where's the first entry point? What are the responsibilities of those agencies? How is that child referred? When that child is referred, what happens? Uh, so that everyone knows their responsibility and no child falls through the crack as has happened in the past. So I feel a little more confident that with the implementation of this protocol and everybody understanding how the system should work and what is their responsibility, that we will be able to get maximum benefit out of all the resources that we are putting into the system. Um, Chairman, um, thank you, Ms. Mrs. Bailey Sobers. Um, so my question is, how far are we then are we from implementation? Because from the answer, it seems that we're still in policy phases. Uh, how far away are we from implementing what we all acknowledge to be this very uh, much needed system? Well, the tool is, um, the target date for the tool to be finalized is the end of March. And um, even before the end of March, I believe we will be testing it out to see how it will be working. So once, once we get the sign off on it, all the agencies will um, have MOUs to ensure that they begin using it. And so we can monitor it to see how we need to um, improve on it as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sobers. Um, I ask Member Scotland to make his contribution. Chairman, as it relates to the Children's Commissioner, can I ask the Honorable Minister, um, has the review of the Children's Commissioner policy has that been completed, Honorable Minister, through you, Chairman? Um, yes, thank you, Member Scotland, for that question. Yes, and it is currently before the committee. And when would we expect completion of that process, Honorable Minister? End of March. End, end of March. End of March 2023. Um, Chairman, the I want to follow up on the transition in question posed by member John earlier on. Do we have any systems in place, like systems honorable minister? So when young people transition, I know that is one of your pet peeves and your ministry, but what are the concrete plans so when they transition out of the children's home they can be reintegrated into society. What are your plans for that, Honorable Minister? Okay, so the transitionary programs uh, with the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. And as I would have mentioned before, the Minister of Youth Development and National Service is co of the Standing Committee on Child Protection. At present, we have a transitioning program in place at Josephine Shaw. We have a facility soon to be constructed. Josephine Shaw is for women. We have a facility to be constructed in Sevilla. We have a male transition home. The program in place already in operation in central Trinidad. It's in St. Madeline. I call St. Madeline, so I don't know if it's really so, but it's in St. Madeline. Um, as, well as, as well as your additional programs being developed through the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. 
to satisfy that requirement for um, adequate transitioning programs for people who are living on homes. Um, also, in Scotland, that St. Jude's, St. Dominic's, and St. Mary's, they also have a transitioning program in place at the facility. Ma, Chair Chairman, as we were, Honorable Minister, as, as we were brainstorming, um, as I was brainstorming, you recall we, we, we had a phenomenon in Trinidad and Tobago called youth camps. I am saying with your collaborative Africa and other ministries, don't you think that maybe the opening of, the reopening of youth camps for both boys and girls can be a, a filter for transitioning of persons from homes where they, they can have a structured environment, give them discipline, give them skills. What do you think of that suggestion, Honorable Minister, and your team? Because you camps are by no means novel. Member Scotland, that is actually in training at the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. That is something that they're, they're, they're actively um, pursuing. And apart from that, in terms of um, diversionary programs that would not only prevent children from uh, who, who run the risk of becoming conflict with the law and may end up having to be placed in a facility, we have programs such as MILA, um, my CCC. Plus, um, in order to engage young people again, the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service would have introduced an agricultural homesteading program. So the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service has been doing a lot of work to ensure that we put systems in place to capture our young people, especially the unattached youth, so that they do not become vulnerable. And, and, and they do not fall into a life of, of, of crime or, or, or a life or, or a vicious cycle of, 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 of abuse. Um, Honorable Minister, could, could you tell me, and this would be, this may be my final line of questioning on this area. How does the ministry see itself? Because I know funding is an issue. Partnering, partnering with corporate Trinidad and Tobago in, in order to bring additional resources to um, child protection. Sometimes it may not only be money, it may be resources. How does the minister, how does the honorable minister see that? Co-opting corporate trend and Tobago may be using skill sets to assist in its development. Um, Member Scotland, we have always been open to partnership and collaboration. Um, including engaging corporate Trinidad and Tobago. I would have mentioned before we had um, um, a, a child rights ambassadors program, and coming off from that, they would have developed the um, the the the, um, the, the quick quiz. And it was corporate Trinidad and Tobago that would have allowed us to facilitate prizes by engaging um, entities in Tobago as well as in Trinidad to provide monetary prizes and other prizes to motivate the public to participate in the program because apart from it just being a quiz, it's an opportunity for persons to learn. Um, as it pertains to services for women who are vulnerable, we are in discussions with the supermarket association mm -hmm. to establish a partnership with them and allow peers to speak some of, some of the ways we engage corporate trend down to be with other entities. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm sure uh, a lot of the um, initiatives that we have been implementing as it relates to, child, to children as well as our um, women and girls have been in collaboration with our international partners as well as um, local um, key stakeholders. Minister sort of mentioned um, the, the MOU with, that we are proposing with the Supermarkets Association. We have had meetings with them already and it is ready to provide some sort of assistance in the form of foodstuff to persons who are survivors of um, domestic violence, they and their children, as well as um, the agencies like the UNICEF, even the IDD have come forward from time to time as it relates to matters pertaining to children and would have funded various activities to allow us to um, either build levels of awareness. I know that UNICEF, um, would have provided an enormous amount of funding to allow us to 
to print those documents that Minister spoke about earlier on that uh, we partnered with TT Post to send out. And that partnership as well with TT Post was a partnership where they would have um, allowed us to do it without really charging us the amount of money that they would usually charge for um, doing work of that nature. Yeah. And um, okay. Member Scotland, and you, yes. and you know when you're engaging children, you know when you're engaging children, you often need something to motivate them to get them more excited. And uh, do you, I can't remember all the sponsors, but I remember Penny Savers, um, Viewport, Massey, mm -hmm. Caribbean Airlines coming about to provide prizes for some of the activities where we engage children to provide prizes, so the children mm -hmm. are being mobile as well. Mm -hmm. Did you sell? So are people are excited to participate and. Once you're participating, you're learning education, knowledge, those are powerful tools for transforming mindset and behavior. Um, Chairman, through you, Honorable Minister and team, a very disturbing, um, a very disturbing findings came out from the report that um the children's homes due to the perception of some of the children who reside in these homes. They had challenges in schools, admitting these children to the schools. Could you tell me, Madam Minister, because I know that you are aware of the law, and so does the, minister, the Honorable Minister of Education, is that still an issue? And how are you going to deal with it? Um, uh, Mr. Scott, let me, let, let me just interject here when it comes to that question. Very, very valid question. And I, subsequent to this, I would like to go to Ms. Member John, then back to Ms. Haynes. Um, what most homes did tell us was that when children are admitted or assigned to these homes, um, the transitionary period to get these kids facilitated to attend a school within the region of the home was the biggest challenge. We had homes in Central getting children from San Fernando and further and beyond San Fernando. And um, they could not have gotten the assistance necessary to get children, their kids, into schools in the area, which poses many logistics battles and also cost um, derived factors um, based on thin resources of being able to wake up all the children in the morning, get everyone ready, and then to send everyone to school. Um, some homes had attached schools, and they also had areas of learning, um, very nice labs and so on and so forth. But the biggest issue was because of the stigma is what was perceived to be. But the level of the cooperation that is necessary that you know, a child from Porter Spring goes to a central home, or a child from Mayara goes to a central home. There's no mechanism to assist and facilitate a placement within the education system, within the geogra geography of the home. And that is leading to a lot of um, operational issues for the children and for their betterment. Thank you, yeah. Member Scott, yes. for that. The yeah. Ministry of Education um, is, admit, is part of the committee, and they have been working on that alongside Children's Authority. I ask PS to speak on it, please. Yes, thank you, Minister. Actually, Chair, um, uh, I was on those um, site visits as well. I was raised as a concern that there was a school just probably a couple of meters away that a child could not get entry into. So it was um, almost a heartbreaking situation, which I would have um, followed up subsequent to those meetings um, with the Children's Authority and um, some other technical officers here that we wouldn't be using through the um, Standing Committee on Child Protection and the various subcommittees to address the situation as a matter of urgency as well as to meet with the um, key officials at the Ministry of Education to bring this to their attention and see how, how we can treat with this matter um, going forward. 
Council Member John, would you like to uh, take the floor now? I, I just, yes, 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 I'm trying to. Ooh. Hold on, I don't know what is happening here. If you could also tilt your camera down as well to get a little bit more height, it would help as well too. But we're hearing you. So suddenly, okay, right. Suddenly something happened, right. Yes, Chairman, I just want to reiterate first what um, Member Scotland said, and then you, Chairman, um, relative to that school issue, that it is a it is a fact, and it's not only the um the operations and what have you. It the resource of um actual funding in terms of money, to you know where you have children going there, they are living at a home in Central, and they have to go to school in San Fernando. Um, it 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 brings into the the whole question that I think Member Haynes had raised about the silos, and I think uh, you know this has such a fundamental impact on the management on operation of these homes, that it, this is something that we really need to address as quickly as possible, the silos, because what the minister is telling us, with respect to the transitional elements, that has to do with the other ministry, some ministry of youth, et cetera. That might be so. But what is happening there is a, much, a lot of down the road in terms of infrastructure for the placement of these children. And whilst that is happening, children have to have to leave these homes at the age of 18 because of the law. And homes don't want to be in contravention of the law, of run a fall of, of the law. So this is something we really, really need to turn our attention to. We can't wait until a facility is built in Sevilla to take in these children because the minister will know the stats even better than me in terms of what happened to our 18-year-old girl children or 18-year-old young men. They find themselves homeless or at the mercy of um, minimum wage jobs where they can't afford to pay for, for too much. And the other point the minister has made is that corporate Trinidad and Tobago providing prizes. Minister, with the greatest respect, that is nonsense. These people are benefiting from the country, you know, and it's not only on, on the, um, the the what, what I'm saying. It, it's not only the responsibility of public servants to be patriotic, but also the private sector. And I think there could be a program where from 16 years, one can be looking at that outer limit when a child is 18, ensure they have the necessary skills to go into one of the um, these private sector companies. They can't only rely on the government to provide spaces for them. They get into the security of police and soldiers. So a lot of these children, you look, some of them, we found them um, doing their schoolwork. They're very good at math. Some are at A levels. Not everybody wants to go into our defense force. They want to explore the things. And we must also ensure we have a duty to ensure that these children can go as far as their ability and ambition will, will take them. So let's get the corporate sector trying to be not only here to run them out, but to be part of some kind of um, attachment or training to assist of uh, these young and vulnerable people who could end up being extremely good um, employees and could add great value, not only to the, um, to the organization, but also to Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Um, one moment, one moment. I'll, I'll allow the um, allow the minister to respond accordingly first. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if I wasn't clear before, Member John, when I spoke about transitionary programs, I feel like did indicate that at present we have Josephine Shaw, which facility deals and another facility to come and stream at Civil for girls. I also did mention that we have a male transitioning program and a home available in St. Madeline. Mm -hmm. So I would identify those two existing those, those two existing facilities as well as I would have indicated that St. Dominic, St. Mary's and St. Mm -hmm. St. Jude's, they also have a transitioning program in place. Also in terms of corporate Trinidad and Tobago providing support, that is done, I mean, I remember at St. Jude's, a young lady from St. Um, Jude's, and St. Jude's was able to get placements for training at the Hyatt, and that was done through Office of the Prime Minister Gender and Child Affairs. Hyatt is state owned. Well We're talking about private sector. Hyatt is not private sector. Hyatt is owned by the state. It makes a profit, yes, but it's um, a state owned company. Um, Member John, may I continue? May I continue, Member John? I'm talking about private Madam, sector. Madam, state, Madam, Madam. Everything is dependent on the state. Why? Madam, Madam, okay. Member, John, okay. just, Mem Member John, um, your point has already been made. Allow the minister to um, fulfill the question, please. 
Right, as I was explaining to Minister, that I is not state or is not um, private sector. Allow me to do that, please. Thank you. I was given an example of you said the need for us to have placement available at options where we engage people, right? Yes, I may be state won't, but it operates as a private entity to an extent. And apart from that, member John, there are other agencies that would facilitate as 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 the point is going to make is as a number of the homes is at least have to talk about the state the state subvent homes that receive state subvention partner with agencies to provide placement. That is something I know for a fact because I have seen it happening. Do we need more involvement? Yes. I could speak of private entities offering counseling services, going into um, homes offering um, facility for therapy or um, uh, therapy and different things like that. We have been working with all sectors, including the corporate sector, but as I mentioned at the beginning, Child care protection is everybody's business. I made a call for all of Trinidad and Tobago to become involved, become part of the process. And in making that call, I'm not just talking to the average man and woman while I go down the street, but I'm speaking also to all sectors of society, including corporate Trinidad and Tobago. And I want a, a minute to talk about a program we have coming on stream that will facilitate those children who are transitioning out of our homes. At program that we see funding for in this fiscal year. Yes, good morning. Chairman Thurio, um, they, we are piloting a project um, right now that, uh, that we intend to allow all community residences to become part of. We have been we are piloting with five homes um, that we have selected based on um, geographic location as well as uh, the number of children that are there based on their age. So they, we have partnered with the Rotary Club um, to do life skills training for um, the teenagers, ages 13 to 15, after which you, they'll be going into vocational training at age 16 and 17. Um, and they'll also be doing another aspect of life skills training, which will be through Heroes Foundation. So the life skills training that Rotary Club is providing would be basic training, things like um, financial advice and that sort of thing, basic life skills training, um, learning to, to manage their bank account, budgeting, that sort of thing. And then later on, when they start the vocational training, they'll be looking, the vocational training, by the way, will be in partnership. We have we are in partnership right now with um, UWE Open Campus as well as YTAP and um, what used to be IBC, which is now the, I don't remember the name, sorry, I don't remember the name, but the, it used to be IBC for radio and broadcasting. So those are the three um, organizations that we're dealing with as a release the pilot. We intend to go broader when we go to the, um, to the larger project. And the vocational training that they'll be receiving while they're doing that, um, sorry, the life skills training that they'll be doing while they're doing the vocational training will be a lot broader. So things like um, interview skills, entrepreneurship, we also have a mentorship program that we're bringing on board. So as I said, we, we are starting it with um, five homes this year, just to pilot it to get information in terms of what um, issues we're going to have as it relates to transportation, as it relates to um, what type of, what kind of um, risk that may come up as it relates to um, things like how do we deal with online versus the um, in-person classes, that sort of information we'll be getting from the pilot and then we intend to make it broader for all the homes later on. Well, what, to, uh, to come back to um, the school placement issue, um, when it comes to the interagency task force and the interministerial ministry task force, um, the level of readiness um, to deal with cases as it happens, and when I refer to real time, um, it would be a suggestion, and I would ask that the suggestion be made that when a, a child is admitted to such a school or, 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 or institution, what goes with it? is 
that full support for uh, the localized geographic um, integration when it comes to the school placements. It should be on a priority list. Um, it should be a priority for when this child has been assigned to such an institution that a placement is there. I, I, when was the ministry aware of the placement issues um, of the children to school that I would like to ask as well. That was that that is a, a matter that children's authority would have always highlighted and um, that um, the issue with children in terms of getting access to to schools etc. And it's, we, we have made a commitment to work to resolve it in collaboration with the Ministry of Education. As I would have mentioned, the minister as well as the deputy permanent secretary are members of the standard committee. Well, I, I would let I would like to add you know. To, to, the, to the listening public, um, I would like to, I mean, it's not just a simple get a school for a child, you know, some children who go to these homes, um, they are not ready. The whole being displaced um, for whatever they have gone through, they may not be ready for outside integration as per, you know, so what was recognized from our visits as well was that Certain school, certain homes uh, were, 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 were not even tooled with respect to psychological and psychiatric um, staff and resources to deal with children who, for example, will come into a home and would end up being uh, not able to integrate with the home, being mute, speaking with siblings and not speaking to others and cooperating and so on. Um, and it's, I mean, this whole thing is so complex when it comes to people management and children management. Um, cannot expunge more and more and, and, and stress that the need for the all integrative real time approach from placements to counseling and case by case management, um, how important it is. I mean, and that is just a statement that I'm making. One of the, before we move to number eight, who has a hand up a little while now, one of the, one of the main <clears throat> points that when we visited homes, um, there were certain challenges encountered with staff under the purview of the Statutory Authority Services Commission, which contributed to children's homes not getting licensed. And it's a reason why I'm touching on this. Um, the reason being is that we spoke about many brick and mortar aspects. We spoke about the fire, the health, we spoke about the officers visiting and so on. I would like to ask uh, a question that says, is, what is the minister's position or the ministry's position um, as it relates to staff under the purview of the SASC uh, that are hindering the licensing of children's homes because you can get plants and machinery up. I mean, I was looking through the comments in the YouTube channel and there's a gentleman um, who stated, oh, Mr. Kasun, he said that, you know, although the licensing is a good start, where it lies in the priority of treating and dealing with the rehabilitation and protection of our children, it, the licensing is necessary, yes, but it, sometimes it may seem that it is secondary. Um, so I'm asking for the purpose of this, um, what is the minister's position as it relates to staff under the purview of the SASC that are hindering the licensing of children's homes? Because certain individuals who belong to certain um, uh, schools of thought or unions or groups um, who, who, who are not willing to go through certification of character or psychiatric evaluation or getting the health issues passed on an individuals and basis which pertains to licensing. Mr. Chairman, that is a challenge that we will have faced um, for quite some time. We've had ongoing discussions with the union as well as even um, the permanent secretaries past and present meeting with the SASC staff at various homes. 
one of the strategies that was used to counteract the prevailing circumstance in terms of the SAC staff being a hindrance to licensing. I know some of the ones would have hired parallel. So for example, St. Dominic's, they had SAC staff, but they had contracting workers parallel. And that wasn't the best model because it was a financial burden. However, we have since removed the SASC from under the, from under, for St. Dominic's, we have removed SASC from, from that particular home. Um, the, although the staff are still there at the moment, they have received cabinet approval for, for the home to transition away from that type of staffing and moving towards where the home has the ability to hire the right type, the right fit, the right grouping of people via contracts, etc. Well, um, well, 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 well commented on this, uh, Madam Minister. I mean, uh, because it really comes um, down to the really comes down to the treatment of the children and the effective yes. counselling. And things like this cannot be a hindrance um, when persons involved <laughs> in school in so, home are involved, they must be prepared to work for the best part of the children uh, immediately and, and, and without, without, um, without bias and, or any type of restriction. However, what we recognize is from the 80s, certain homes, the same home, home you discussed that was allowed to move away from it. As early as the 80s and the 90s, um, these homes, um, these homes, complained about the structured level of staff from the SESC. And um, it is heartening to know that homes did receive approval to move away from the SESC. However, it is going to be better expense to the state because it is a yeah. parallel system. Um, what measures are putting, being put in place to mitigate the migration away from these? And when did the homes receive the approval to attempt to move away from the oh. yes, and was it just one specific home? Um, um, Mr. Chairman, I will start asking, uh, allow my peers to come in. Um, for, for the uh, the staff who are, that the particular home I'm speaking about now to be fully terminated, that's correct, mm -hmm. or removed, that would have to be done through SASC and CPU. Does it? Through the SASC and CPU. You remember we had the issue with St. Michael's and one of the strategies I used back then to treat with that issue was to close St. Michael's. Did it work out to the best? Because we're still waiting on the CPU to finalize separation packages for staff. So I'm going to ask my peers who is the accounting officer to further explain. So thank you, Minister, and through you, Chair. Um, so to answer your question, the, it was one home. It was the St. Dominic's uh, Children's Home. Um, approval was received, and efforts are being made to resolve that situation in terms of the staff. Okay. Um, the, the, I think that um, there was some consideration by St. Mary some time ago. I recall that they would have indicated as well the need or, or, or they were thinking about doing that as well. I also want to indicate as well that when this transition or this change finally comes to an end uh, or resolve, it would not be um, two set of staff being paid, um, paid at the same time. It would just be a subvention paid to um, the St. Dominic's Children Home, and that would be it. I know in the past what has been done, in part, is that um, staff would have been placed elsewhere where there are similar positions. I know drivers would have been placed at the corporation and other persons would have been placed elsewhere. This will also indicate that um, a meeting was facilitated with the union. I was there at that meeting, it was facilitated by the chair of the SCSC. Well, then the new chair of the SCSC and the union was clear that they are supportive of the, um, the, the move. This is, this is law. And, and their members would have to um, comply. They were not against members getting their uh, medical certificate and the certificate of character. So, um, yes, and it was, it, it was in recent times. Um, yes, it's been very kind. It's only recently the union yes, has been yes, yes, recent times. Another indicator, the meeting facilitated by the new chair of the SCSC. Yeah? 
And um, I eventually would have followed up with, with calls to the, um, to the relevant member of the union asking that they communicate and they, you know, they reach out to the staff because it is all in the best interest of the children. At, and I know at St. Mary's, St. Mary's has been very facilitating. They, I think they were paying and they were asking the, um, the, the doctors to come there and facilitate the staff getting their medical checks up, checkups and stuff like that. So I think that we, that, albeit uh, most recently, is a step that um, was initiated to resolve that particular situation. Thank you very much. Member Haynes, you still want to contribute? Absolutely, Chairman. Um, I had some technical difficulties, so please excuse me for the short time that I was not present at the meeting. Um, Chairman, I know we would have moved on to a, a new um, line of questioning, but again, forgive me. I had a question. Well, I had a brief comment on the transitioning aspect, um, and then I, I'll go on to my other question, because there are two main focus. Well, there are several things that we're looking at. Um, well, two of the things that really stand out would be one, what happens after you leave the 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 children's home to the, the protection of the state? And what happens to it, what can we do to ensure that you're never in that space so that you are not part of this system at all? And so if we can get those two things right, um, we'll be in a lot in a much better space. But only the issue of transitioning out of children's homes. Look, um, we exist in, in Trinidad and Tobago, and for those of us who are part and parcel of representative politics, you get it very, very almost daily, the issue faced with people, young persons coming out of the school system, of the regular school system, who cannot find job placements, who cannot find some, you know, and this is from secondary level, tertiary level, et cetera. So we are facing a youth empl employment problem in Trinidad and Tobago, across the board and that's something that we have to acknowledge. So when we discuss what happens to children coming out of children's homes, they are also coming into a space where it is difficult overall. So we really cannot discuss it and say, okay, we'll put these things in place, we'll put um, vocational training in place and we'll put it, but you're still going to exist in, in regular Trinidad and Tobago, so you're going to find difficulties that are being faced across the board, which is sustainable, um, employment for the, uh, this generation of Trinidadians and Tobagonians. So I just wanted to put that on the board and to make sure that we clarify that in our thinking so that while we are discussing the important points of what happens when you come out of the children's home, let us not negate what is happening overall and what we're facing and therefore adjust what we are looking for in our effectiveness to cater for all of these things. Uh, and so now I'll go to my question on how do we, we, are, we were discussing creating a system that you are not in an institution and so that we are reducing um, institutionalization of children, which we have, those of us who exist in the system are well aware that it, it is not the ideal space. And so it brings me back to the kinship program. And I mean, to, to circle back to how I treat with issues uh, in general, what are we looking at in terms of a timeline for implementation and the timeline for the rollout? I just want to clarify in, in the minds of the public where exactly we are and, and, and so that we can then assess whether or not we're moving uh, very deliberately in the right direction, if we're moving at all, or if we are really going to be circling around a discussion policy making phase and and how far we are we from implementation and therefore being able to assess results and the impact on the system overall thank you member haynes for that question i acknowledge the recommendations made um in terms of the kinship care policy at the last meeting which was held on the 17th of september 17th of september i would have February, sorry, February, I would have requested from the chairman of the Children's Authority the policy to be presented to me as minister so I could share it with the standing committee. I did receive the policy document last Friday. It has been circulated to the wider standing committee for review and comments. In, 
It has been it has been circulated internally at Office of the Prime Minister, and then we will then explain up to the standing committee by next week. Um, in terms of the start of implementation, the Children's Authority and I guess truly really work of the subcommittee mm -hmm. responsible for that area would determine that. And I'm going to ask um, Mrs. Bailey Subas to comment again on the particular subcommittee and the time period for them to report on the their work program. <clears throat> So thank you, Minister. Um, that particular kinship policy would be addressed by both the legislation subcommittee and also the subcommittee treating with matters related to the Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. And um, we ensured that uh, both of those subcommittees would have their finger on that particular policy because as you mentioned, we do have funding to move forward with it and we recognize that it's going to help with the whole situation of the placement uh, of children for the 31st of March um, deadline. Um, the subcommittees, because they haven't met, they, we can't give a time frame, but because we do have a policy, um, I feel within two months, there should be some movement going forward with this policy. But it depends on what discussions the, the two subcommittees have and next week, uh, we would be in a better place at the end of the week perhaps to know uh, where they are going with that policy because their work plans are to be submitted after their meetings this coming week. Thank you very much. Um, Member Haynes, are you completed with your, are you completed with your line of questioning? Um, well, I guess I just have one quick comment um, on, on this. Um, I appreciate that um, it is not often that we are able to really give an exact working time frame and whatnot. But uh, in my time in, in, the, in the space that I've existed in um, dealing with public policy, one of the, the key things across the board that we've seen is that we have um, a lot of very good intention a lot of very good announcements and 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 plans and the that implementation gap that space that we find ourselves from the intention to the impact on the the, the persons who are intended to receive this benefit it really has us as a society um, in the space that we're in and and I I mean I listen to the minister and time and time again the minister speaks about you know, this is um, something all of us have to work towards. I mean, everybody has a space and everyone has a role to play. And I completely agree. But a big, big, big part of it is that that we really start to get effective timelines, spaces for monitoring and evaluation and assessing programs as they come on stream and really not circling constantly around um, the discussion phases as we're, we we aren't going to see the results that we are looking for. So thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Member Haynes, for that um, that recap on, on, on that intention. I mean, it, it, it's the silo effect that we try to move away from through these type of meetings to engage the public and engage the public, the powers that be to move forward in a coordinated manner. Um, I would like to, ask, to make a statement and to ask a question before I proceed to member Scotland. And let's look back at the whole purpose of this, I mean, the topic at hand. Um, for the, especially for the, for the benefit of the listening public and the viewing public. What we definitely, what definitely happened with the, the release of these reports and, and, and the space and, and in the manner of, of how the, the topic was ventilated, we saw a lot of uproar and reaction when it came to the topic, which was child abuse, and to the listening and viewing public. Um, for the few homes that was visited, um, it was either it was dealt with, it was a long time ago, or not a frequent or didn't happen issue. I would, it would be a miss if I didn't ask the question to the ministry. Um, 
if we didn't discuss the allegations of child abuse within these homes and how was it addressed and what type of time frame were we dealing with when these issues were raised. OPM, your mic is off and your camera is also off. Camera back on there. Thank you, Chair. Um, the minister just asked to be excused for a brief while, yeah? Um, to, uh, in, uh, in answering your question, um, Chair, um, these matters, from what I recall, as soon as they were received by the um, Children's Authority, I understand because I did check as well, that they were all referred to the police for the investigation. Um, a, a number of the matters in, in, in moving around to these homes that did indicate that um, some of the matters that were raised in the, um, in the report were dated, and some of these persons were either, they may have either passed on or no longer in the employ of the various agencies. Yeah? Um, but in response, the matters were to the police within the time frame and our police for the investigation. So we did find out that as well, that the, these matters were dated. Members of staff who were either no longer employed with the homes and then also that the, the matters existed within the realms of the police authority, the police as the authority to do investigate. But it, um, it definitely shed a very, very, very bad light, um, which, was, which has stigmatized the homes. Um, because what we found was that there were very, very, very high level of committed staff and caring staff. Um, we are not investigators, but from what we perceived and what we understood, uh, these matters are good. Like I said, it was dated. Um, what, what measures are being put in place to quickly deal with any such allegation of wrongdoing to the children in the homes? As, as, as the minister has rejoined, I, I would like to put that question back on the table. So the question, Mr. Chairman, is what we are doing if we if there are any allegations of wrongdoing in a in a home, right? Okay. Um. Once the matter will most likely first go to the Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. The Children's Authority has a duty to ensure that the matter is reported, especially if um it entails gross abuse. It, it must be reported to the police service. Um, additionally, there are investigations conducted by the authorities, sometimes investigations conducted by the homes. If um, an allegation is proven to be correct, then we anticipate that the necessary legal procedure will occur to ensure that that child receive um, justice. So for example, as Minister would have received, people send things to me right via my MP page. They know I'm the Minister for Gender and Child Affairs, so they'll send things to me at my MP page. And my advice is always, once it comes to me, please report it to the police. If it, is, um, if it has not been reported in the home or to the Children's Authority, please report it to the police. We have the Children's Authority and the police service, they are charged with that responsibility. The Office of the Prime Minister, we cannot investigate, we don't have that power to investigate a crime. So my advice is always to please report it to the police, child protection unit, or the children's authority. And I want to encourage those persons who send things to my MP page inbox to please send it to the police. That is the right avenue. Send it to the children's authority. Member Scotland. Chairman, I do not think that it is all doom and gloom, and I know that the minister is committed. So may I ask the other minister the question? Oh, minister, in light of everything that we have seen and heard today, could you tell the country, could you tell the country, how do you and your ministry intend 
to augment the safeguarding of children in residences? And how do you, what plans are in place to remove that stigmatization that will now allow them to get proper jobs, that will now allow them to be in, in, in schools that, that they deserve? How does the ministry, how do you intend to deal with these issues, Honorable Minister? So we are doing any programs through the ministry as far as reasonable, reasonably possible. We try to ensure that we engage children from the various homes, ensure that they get that exposure themselves once it is reasonably possible. So the Child Rights Ambassadors program I mentioned before, we would have engaged children from various children's homes as well so that they themselves become advocates for their rights as well as respons as well as educate themselves and the public about the responsibilities that are associated with those rights. I'm proud to know that we had a resident who was one of our ambassadors who went on to be nominated for an award based on his book. But Member Scotland is about people changing their attitude and their mindset. So I want to share a very real example and something that disturbed me a lot. Sometimes when you're trying to, 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 to find locations to site buildings or to put up facilities for or vulnerable children, you may you will hear sometimes hear adults saying, I don't want kind of people in my space. But they are our people, they are our children. And as I said from the beginning, you may, Mr. Chairman, I, I wouldn't I'm not gonna go into that, but this is this is real. This is real, right? And at the end of the day, these are our children. And they're human these beings. Are, yeah, these are the boys and girls, despite of their, their, their circumstances in the past, who would grow up to in the future Trinidad and Tobago. So I want to encourage all citizens to really not look at the circumstance, but look at the person, look at the child, look at the individual being, and give them the same level of respect, love, that you would demand for yourself or for your own children. We have to continue the work in terms of public education and sensitization, and we have been doing the work. Yes, there's more work to be done, but we have been trying to engage the public to change mindset, to create awareness, but at the end of the day, it calls for individuals to make a concerted effort to do better and be better. So for those persons when we're trying to find a place of reception center, say, my community too posh them, you have to come better than that. At the end of the day, you don't know what that person may turn out to be. There's an other time I hear on I-95 pretty often. And as I'm sure it's I-95 or one of the gospel station, I was talking about various scenarios and he said, if this mother took this particular action, then this person would not have been here. And the person was referencing was Jesus Christ. You know, at that time, there would have been a certain stigma around um, an unwed mother being pregnant, and delivering a child. And it's that same sort of attitude. Yes, a child might be in a home now. Yes, they might have had a rough start in life, but it's up to us to work collectively to ensure that they have a better future, that they have a better opportunity to go on to become meaningful contributors to national development. Uh, Madam Minister, um, in that light of your, of that question, um, and also in the, in the line that you have started, I would like to um, invite you to make some closing, brief closing comments at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the, thank you as well as the members of the committee for the opportunity to come before you today to report to the people of Trinidad to be able on the work that we have been doing. I must commend and thank the staff of the General Child Affairs Division of the Office of the Prime Minister, as well as the members of the Standing Committee for the effort that we are putting into creating a robust child care and protection system. 
Mr. Chairman, I start by saying child care and protection is everybody's business. And that is why I wish to close. Yes, as minister, I have a certain responsibility. As a government, we have a certain responsibility, but the greatest power in ensuring an effective rover system is the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm encouraging every citizen to speak up, speak out, use your voice, use your power of influence for good. Together, we can create the type of society where we can all feel proud that our children are being nurtured, are being cared for in a place that is safe, secure, and that embraces tolerance at all levels. I thank you. Many thanks, Minister. Um, I would like to thank the attending members um, for today's meeting. I would like to thank the Minister and her team for the contributions to today's proceedings. Uh, I would like to thank the committee members who participated remotely for this virtual hearing. And very much importantly, the staff of the Office of the Parliament for your continued procedural and logistical support. And most importantly, the viewing and listening audience. It has been a fruitful um, discussion. I believe no one can leave there thinking that the intention is not there. However, there's a lot of work remaining to be done. And I would like to think that this drive to get things done correctly, um, albeit should be happening all the time, remains constant and consistent. And um, uh, I, I do look forward to um, laying in the lower house, the, low, the, the upper house, um, a report very soon based upon our findings that would assist in moving forward um, as it pertains to this matter. Um, I thank you all. I thank the listening public and uh, for all those who attended this morning. Um, may God be with us all um, and, and, and guide our hands, minds, and the way forward on this very sensitive and important matter. I thank you all most kindly. Thank you. Hi, members. Keisha Peterkin. Um, if you all could just hold on for a couple minutes so we could... Um, sure, sure, absolutely. Sure thing. So we could discuss any points raised from today. So going forward with the report... You know, so we would all be on the same page. And if we want to end it here, or if anybody